Amen. Pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I'm open. God, I'm ready. Speak to me now. You can be seated. I, I hate to admit this today, but I never wanted kids of my own. I, I never did. I, I shouldn't say that. I should clarify a little bit. I, I, I always loved kids. Uh, I mean, obviously I was a kid. I thought kids were cool. As I grew up, I, was, I played sports. I, I played baseball in the summer, hockey in the winter. And, uh, you know, it was just busy, busy, busy all the time. And so eventually I was like, I got to choose one career or the other. And, and I was missing youth camps and stuff. So I decided I, I'd stop playing ball because I was playing competitive hockey, competitive ball and wanted a little free time. And, and so even though I was 16 years old, ready for retirement, I got recruited to coach kids. And my little brother was 10 years old, Marcus, who was on the drums today. And, and so I started my coaching career. And so I coached the kids to a provincial title that year year and we got to go to Atlantics and so it's not that I didn't like kids I always liked kids I just didn't want any of my own and one of the reasons or probably the greatest reason that I didn't really want kids of my own was because I really kind of saw the tra trajectory of the world in which we live and even as a, a young adult and looking at stuff going on in the world and seeing the direction it was taking, I was just like, God, I don't want to bring up a child in, in this world. And it was in some prayer time and just alone time with God that, that I'm just talking to God and like conviction started to hit my heart. And, and it was like, you're kind of being selfish, aren't you, Justin? I'm like, no, it's for, for their sake. And and this conviction hit me so strong, and it was like the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, said, yeah, th this world is changing, and, and, and people are forgetting about God, but Justin, I'm going to need kids and young adults in this generation that will love me and serve me and be a light in their world. And all of a sudden, my prayer time and my desire started to shift. And it wasn't just like, oh, I want to have kids to change diapers. I want to have kids to go to hockey games. I want to have kids to coach or do this. But I actually started to pray and say, God, if this is your desire, I pray that I would have kids. But I pray that my kids would fall in love with you and be a light in this generation. We've been talking over the last few weeks, and we're wrapping up our series today on raising kingdom kids. Someone say raising kingdom kids. Raising kingdom kids. Our goal over time is to transfer our child's dependence on us to a complete dependence on God. We want kids that will grow up loving Jesus, loving people, and changing their world. We've been looking in the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going to read it today from the message paraphrase. It says this, The people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate with, and let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you will never get in. Then, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. Today, we're going to just get really practical on, on a few things. And I already mentioned to you a couple weeks ago, I'm in the middle of this whole raising kids thing. I, I have a 12-year-old and... A, almost 10 year old and so even as I share with you today this is just stuff that that I'm trying to research and I'm trying to get a grasp on I, I'm not here as like the expert that look at my perfect kids some of you know my kids right and you're like, yeah, uh, that, that's not what, what we're doing today. I, I'm not saying that, that this is a model that, that just, boom, if you do this, everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, I, I'm trying to learn along with you, and I, I want to just share with you maybe some things that, that I've been looking at and some things that I've been researching when it comes to raising kingdom kids. Uh, you, you can look at it different ways, and many of you probably have read 
And they basically say there's four stages to raising kids or four stages to parenting. Uh, you could read at different places and they, they might kind of have some different terms to explain these stages. But a lot of you may be in one of these stages with your kids or grandkids or even as an aunt or uncle or whatever the case might be. You'll look and you'll have some kids in your life in one of these stages. Uh, I was reading from an article in Godly Parent and they kind of walked through these four different stages. The first one is the discipline years. Someone say the discipline years. This is the age of zero to five. Uh, th this is what they said in Godly Parent. They said the child's primary, primary need is control. To learn that there are both boundaries and consequences, these are the years where who is in control must be established. Then it says the primary responsibility for a parent is consistency in teaching their children who is in control, what the boundaries are, and shaping the foundation of their worldview. Consistent loving discipline is a must during this crucial development stage. Now, as we just talk about some of these things, I told you it's going to be practical today. Don't think like, oh no, I missed it. Or, wait a minute, my kids are 18 or 17. That, that, that even as we look at this, this is just sort of the idea. And I don't want anyone today to feel discouraged or like, oh no, I blew it. We, we all need to be active at some point, right? And, and whatever age the children are that, that are under our care, we need to be active. This next stage of parenting, they say, is this, is the training years. This is age 5 to 12. The primary need, and, and so some of the teens, you're, you're, you're hitting the upper, you know, maybe you are preteen today, and so you're kind of at the end. So you're getting some information as well as mom and dad today. Children's primary need in this age is gaining understanding. To understand the why behind what of your family values, what are your family values and expectations. Correction still needed, but with more explanation. The parent's primary responsibility responsibility is shaping worldview through teaching and training questions and answers and applying faith and truth in real life situations who today in this room raise your hand you have children in stage one all right how many of you have children in stage two all right Let, let's go to the third the third stage is this this is the coaching years all right, so all of you that stayed in our class today, this is your age group for the most part. All right, and, and here is the primary need of, of you guys. In this age of 12 to 18, loving guidance. To be guided from the sidelines to know the plays of how to practically live out their faith. Our primary responsibility as parents is practical practice. We've trained them, now it's time to start nudging them towards the edge of the nest and test and refine their training and make sure they are ready to fly on their own. If you practice this principle of more control now, less control later, you may enjoy some early years of quality friendship in this stage. I, I, I'm setting some groundwork because we're going to get a little deeper into some of, of these areas and some stuff that I believe is important. At least I'm trying to apply it in my parenting, as Paige and I try to, try to raise kingdom kids. Uh, it, it's amazing, though, because sometimes we like to think our kids are really, really young, don't we? Maybe I'm the only one. I, I don't want to admit my kid's 12 years old. Uh, how many of you forget what you knew when you were 12 years old? Like, if you really took time and started to think back, like, what was I doing at 12 years old? What were some of my thought processes? What was going on? And, and all of a sudden, it get a little scary because we realize, wait a minute, my kid's that age. I, I was doing that. We like to think our kids are a lot younger than they really are. Do you know what? I know many of you know this, but even the Jewish custom, the Jewish culture, that they actually celebrate when a child turns 12. Because in Jewish custom, that child is actually now entering adulthood. That's crazy to think about. But that's one of the reasons why all of the parenting stages, they would say that in this age, it becomes coaching years. And then there are the friendship years, and that is 18 
plus, and moms and dads, you cannot wait for those years, right? Like, let's get through this, and then we can just be friends. The child's primary need would be space, to be allowed to experience their independence by making their own decisions with a hands-off approach from mom and dad. Primary responsibility for us as parents, support. You've helped them develop character, responsibility, and a biblical worldview. Now it's time to watch them soar on their own. The four stages of parenting. I, I want to talk today, and I want to just get into discussing with you a, a, few, of, a few of them. And, and just looking at, even at scripture and to just some things that hopefully will help you today as you are striving to raise kingdom kids. And so we're going to start today and we are going to talk about discipline. And all the teenagers said, yes! Let's try it again. And all the teenagers said, yes! <laughs> They're all shaking their head, no! We don't want to talk about this. I, I want to talk to you about discipline. Now again, the stage of the parenting, it, it would tell us that, that it is most important that discipline happens between zero and five. It doesn't mean we don't discipline and the discipline shifts, but, but hey, if you have young baby, you have very little children, this is the best time to discipline. This is the best time to establish kind of so, some rules or regulations, at least establish who is the boss. How many kids today are the boss of their households, no matter how old they are? Here's what you need to know about discipline, though. When you love, you will discipline. When you love, you will discipline. Tells us in Hebrews, it says, Have you not forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes though each one he accepts as his child. I, I want you to just let that sink in for a moment because so often even in raising kids it, it's kind of like, well, well, we don't want to be the bad guy. Just so you know, mom and dad never want to be the bad guy or bad girl in your life. And, and so it's like, I, I don't want to discipline, you know, because I love them so much. But true love will correct, right? And scripture would tell us that, that God corrects those he loves. Proverbs would tell us in chapter 19, discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. We've mentioned this before, and just so you do know, Proverbs are, are wise sayings. Proverbs are probabilities. So when you're reading the Proverbs, it, it's not, when you're reading it, it, don't just look at it and say, like, oh, this is a promise of God. No, it's a probability. Okay, so when you're reading through Proverbs, you're understanding that, that if I do this, this is the probability of what the outcome will be. A, another proverb says this, discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. Let, let me ask you this today because, and I know I, I don't always go this practical, but we're going really practical today. And, and some people, they, they kind of err on no discipline or they err on we're just disciplining everything, right? Like we, we, we are in charge. And how many of you had parents? Maybe you shouldn't admit that. Mom and dad's here with you even though you're an adult today. And it's like everything was discipline. And you're going to do what you're told when you're told it. And, and you live this life and, and it's like there's, you can err on either side. But, but the goal of discipline, you need to know this today. And even when you think about God and his correction in our life. The goal of discipline is course correction. And so if you are involved in children's life and, and, and you are in a place of, of offering discipline, we need to always remember that, that the whole goal here is course correction. That, that it, it's not just the action that we're disciplining, but, but okay, we want our children to understand that, that, that this isn't right and, and we want to get them on course. It's not just a punishment for something they, they have done. It, it's important. That we always understand this 
as parents. And this is why parents, when it comes to discipline, sometimes we have to discipline our children different than other children, right? Did anyone walk through this yet? Anyone have more than one child? Raise your hand. And man, what worked on child number one? Worked so good. Child number two comes on the scene. And you think, okay, our course of action, our strategy to get them on the right course, and especially with discipline, it is going to be the same thing, and we try the same thing with that child. It doesn't work that good, does it? And so all the time as parents, we got to realize that it's not just about a punishment for an action, but, but our goal as parents, our goal as people that are raising up kids is that we would get them on the right course. And so sometimes discipline, often discipline will look different from child to child. I, I do know this, as you look at this, uh, even as, as I look at our own kids, and I, I was thinking on this subject that, that there have been times that, that we've disciplined our children, whatever that looks like for you. Again, you got to figure out what, what works and Again, our kids have different personalities and what's working for one isn't working for the other. But there have been moments that our children have had consequences for maybe something that they have done or, or just an attitude or whatever it might be. And, and I know you guys probably think I'm crazy and I'm not disciplined enough. But there are a lot of times that I've set out some discipline that as time's gone on, for example, let me just give you an example. Maybe this will make a little more sense. Uh, so the consequences are going to be you have no access to any video games, any electronics for a week. Anyone tried that? And, and so th these, are, these are the consequences. And, and you might think, well, man, I'm not disciplined enough. But, but there have been times that I have given this discipline so just so you guys all know, your mom and dad's not bad. Pastor Justin and Paige are just as bad as them, all right? And, and so, but there have been times that, that we've given some consequences and said this is what's going to happen because of what you did or, or an attitude, whatever it might be. But over time, we might have said a week and on day four, we're like, hey, you're, you're allowed to, to be on electronics. All of a sudden, we're like heroes, it's like, what, really? I thought I had three more days. But why do we do that? It's because we start to notice they understand. They've learned the lesson. And so it's not just about some punishment and you've got to get to the end of the punishment. It's about are we course correcting our children? Have they actually learned? Because if the goal is for them to learn a lesson, then we've done our job. Here's a couple of things that's very important when it comes to discipline. Discipline should not be a reaction to our emotions. And I am guilty of this one. Because a lot of times, discipline is a reaction to my emotions. We never should discipline because our children made us angry. And you never should discipline when you are angry. But that happens so often. That, that our kids, ah, kids, I, I'm glad you're in my class today. This is fun to have you guys here when we're talking about this stuff. But, but sometimes it, it's like our kids can do things. We're just like, oh, why can't they get it? Why can't they understand it? And, and then all of a sudden we'll just react in, in anger, especially when siblings are fighting, right? Like they're fighting and so it makes me angry. And so I'm going to handle this and I'm going to deal with it. And, but it's important we never discipline as a reaction to our emotions. Another one would be this, never discipline because of embarrassment. And very often that can happen for parents especially because our children may do something in a certain setting and the reality is it's not so much what they did but they caused us embarrassment. And very often we will respond in some form of discipline because of that embarrassment. Discipline should never be about us but always about the long-term development of our children. And this is why scripture would teach along these lines. Listen to what it says in Colossians. 
chapter 3. It says, children, obey your parents. Here, let's try this. Teens will say this. Children, say it with me. Children, come on, all he is. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. And so we see a great, a great command. It says, for this pleases the Lord. But then it says, this is for moms and dads. Parents, you ready? This is your line. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Let's try that, adults. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Or they will become discouraged. Do you know what? I got thinking. My, my parents are away today. They, they celebrated this week their 50th anniversary. That's exciting. They're probably joining us online today. And, and we just honor them. Can we just give them a hand? I, they, I'm sure they are enjoying Florida right now. But 50 years and I got thinking of this, though. I thank God for my parents. I thank God that they fought for their marriage, that I got to be raised in a nuclear family setting, and I'm just so thankful for that. But I got thinking about this. Do you know what? And maybe they could correct me on this, but to my memory, I never had a lot of rules as a kid. I didn't have a lot of rules. But I did know my expectations. It wasn't that my parents just had all these rules and it's like this and this and this and this and this. And so it was like, okay, as long as I keep that. Because what? Rules. Parents, I don't, I know I don't want to tell them your secret. But when there's rules, we like to figure out how to break them. Right? And I got thinking about my life that, that I didn't have a bunch of rules, but I just knew the expectations. I, I, I knew what was expected of me. I, I believe this is important as we look at raising our kids when we talk about discipline, is that consequences should not be predetermined. It, it was Andy Stanley that, that I, I heard talking about this, and it, it just hit me so hard. And I, again, I got to reflect on, on my life, but it, it's not that we predetermine the consequences because the message a lot of times that we would tell our kids you know for example we tell our kids that if you do that this is going to be the result and what they're doing like an analysis like is it worth the, you know is it worth the risk here you know what I'm going to go do and I already know the the end result uh, but really what we are doing when the consequences are predetermined we're telling our kids what we already are anticipating that you may mess up. We're already anticipating you not doing what you're told. And so we've already thought out the consequences. I, I remember I, I, was, I was young. As I grew up and got a little older, I realized I was not the person at most fault in this story. Uh, it was a guy that was actually on staff, a pastor, a young pastor, just got out of Bible college. He was working with my dad. And so one Friday night, uh, we, we go out, and our church at the time, we, we played softball Friday nights, just pick up softball, and we'd go play, and some of you used to play, and it was at Henry Park, and so I, I'm like 14 years old, 15 years old, and so I go, and the ball time was 11 to 12. I, I knew that my sort of curfew was 12 o'clock, but I knew my curfew could be broke as long as I called mom and dad and said, hey, I'm going to be late tonight or whatever because they always knew where I was and there was this open communication. But that night I go to the ball field and this pastor, young pastor on staff, he's responsible for taking me home. Young pastors sometimes are not wise. Oh, my goodness. So we go to the ball field. Now, I knew that he had a had a crush. He had a thing for this other girl from the church. And so after the ball game at midnight, he's got a 14-year-old, the pastor's son, the pastor's kid out with him. And, and, and then some of the young adults that was his age group, they, they kind of get chatting. And they're like, hey, we should go to Pizza Delight. And, and so he looks at me and he says, do you think your parents would mind if you go to Pizza Delight? Now bear in mind, this is before the age of texting. 
This is before the age of cell phones. So at least, kids, you can send mom and dad a quick message, say, hey, this is what's up, what's the deal? We didn't have that then. And it's midnight, so I'm not going to go find a phone and call them and wake them up and freak them out. Right? So I look at him, and I know it's going to be fun for me. And I'm like, yeah, my parents wouldn't mind. We go out to eat, and then, of course, he now has this girl that he has a crush on, and she needs a drive home, and she lives the opposite side. She lives out close to Mactaquack Dam, and, and so he looks at me. He's like, is it okay if we drive her home first, and then I'll take you home? I'm 14 years old. This is getting funner as we go. Like, yeah, this is great. But let's go. And so we go to her house now. Oh, my goodness. As I look at it as an adult, I was like, where was this guy's mind? Well, now I know where his mind was. But anyway, we go to this girl's house, and then she's kind, and so she invites us in. She's like, why don't you just come in for a minute? It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. It's like, I've never done this in my life. I'm like, yeah, let's go. And then she's like, well, do you want to watch a movie? So at this point, the young pastor had enough wisdom to look at me and say, Too bad we didn't tell your parents you were spending the night at my house. To which I said, we have a new feature on our phones. Some of you might remember when this first came out. We've got this new feature. It's called voicemail. I can call my house number without actually it ringing and I can leave them a voicemail. I forget. Some of you might remember. You press star 99 or something. Then the phone number, it would go directly to voicemail. So at about 2.30 a.m., I call my parents and I leave a voicemail. Yeah, I'm staying at Pat's house tonight. Uh, just, just want to let you know. Da 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 da. And, and and then hang up. We watch a movie. It's now 4:30 a.m. We're driving back to Marysville. And as we're driving back to Marysville, I, I all of a sudden realize that maybe wasn't the smartest thing to do. My parents have never got voicemail. They might not get this message. They're going to wake up freaking out. And so I tell this young pastor, hey, maybe you should drop me off at home. So I sneak in our house about 4.45 in the morning, crawl into my bed, and all is well. I made it home safely. The next morning, (laughs) my mother comes in and she says, where were you last night? I went to ball. (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) That's where I went. She's like, where did you go after ball? And, well, I, you know, we just had to drive this girl home. And, 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 you know, and at this point I knew, okay, this, this isn't good. What happened on their side? Of course, mom woke up about 2 a.m. in the morning freaking out. Where's her son? Wakes my dad up. Wakes my sisters up. Have you heard from Justin? What's going on? Again, it was before the age of cell phones. They can't just call this young pastor. They can't do anything. So, so what is going to happen? They're freaking out. And finally at about 4 o'clock or whatever time it was, I, I guess before the movie, so, but in their world, about 4 a.m., they pick up the phone and they're going to try to call this young pastor's house to see if they know anything. And they pick it up and the phone's going beep, 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 beep. And my dad, if anyone knows Pastor Joe and the other side of Pastor Joe, he's freaking out and he's like, what's wrong with this stupid phone? It won't stop beeping. And he gives it to my mother and she's like, well, I think there's a voicemail and so they check it, and they get me, of course, time-stamped. <laughs> I'm just spending the night at Pat's house. What I realized, though, even in that moment, that I did not know what the consequences were going to be. But I knew there would be consequences. Guarantee you that young pastor had greater consequences than I did. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> What I'm saying is this, though, that even as a a child in that moment, I didn't know the consequences. They weren't predetermined. And my parents walked with me through this. Okay, well, what what are we going to do? And this is is why you can't do that. And and actually, I was able to process it along with them. and, And I was good with the consequences. Because I realized and I understood, and, and I'm just telling you as parents that it's important that, that as we discipline, we don't just predetermine the consequences. Uh, we discipline for what they did and not who they are. Just to note, parents, who, whoever you are, that, that always with our children. I, I, I try to always make sure I have this conversation with my kids, is that you are a great kid, but what you just did is not what good kids do. 
I never try to look at my kids and say, you're a bad kid or you're this or you're that. I always am letting them know and speaking who I believe they are in Christ first and letting them know that their actions or their attitude do not line up with who they really are. It says in Ephesians, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Which brings us to the second thing. And we've got to go quick through, through the last two. The second one is this. We talk discipline, but it's training. It says this in Proverbs. Again, a proverb. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And earlier in this series, we read from Deuteronomy, and, and I, I love it. We'll pick it up in verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. I, I know I had more out back, but ju just pick it up. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again. Someone say again. And again to your children. Talk about them when you are home and when you are on the road and when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Moms, dads, grandparents, anyone that has children under your care, it is important. Especially as God followers. As kingdom first people that we are training our children. It is important that we teach them the love of God. It's important that our kids know that they're created in his image. I remember hearing this as a kid. And some of you, you grew up around church and you remember this statement. I think there were songs and everything about this. But it was along this line that, that God doesn't make mistakes. Our kids need to know that they were created in the image of God, that God formed them in the womb of their mother, that, that God does not make mistakes. He has plans and he has purposes for them. They need to know about the love of Jesus. They need to know how to treat others. They need to know how to, to live as Christians. They need to know that, that they are citizens of heaven first. They need to know that, that as Christians, we probably are going to have a very different worldview than the world in which we live. It's important that we train up our children. We looked at, at this in, already in the four stages of parenting, but they would say that this is most vital between age 5 and 12. And, and sometimes we don't realize this. We sort of think, well, they're just kids, and we'll let them just kind of go through life, and they'll come to church. They'll get a little lesson on Sunday morning, but we're not really active in training them up. But, but yet everything would tell us that these are the most important years. These are the most important years from 12, 5 to 12 years old that, that really most people's worldviews are already being formed. And, and not to say that if, if you say, well, my kid's 17 or whatever, that when Jesus Christ comes in and someone's born again, all of a sudden everything can change. But, but it's a lot more work now going through all the other stuff that they've already been taught as we try to, to now build our lives on God's word. And so as parents especially, it is important that we're training our kids and teaching them the truth of God's word. There's a reason today. There's a reason today that even in our education system, they are now talking about and teaching stuff to kids way younger than they ever used to. Why? I challenge you to really think about it. It's because they realize and understand we've got to teach them some of these things down here while they're still young. And their minds are being formed. I, I, I often say it like this. Actually, just recently thought of this as I, I was processing and even having conversations with some parents. But, but everything that we hear goes through what I would call the filter of first information. Everything we hear will go through a filter of first information. And I want you to just, just think about it for a moment that, that even today, even as adults, when, when we hear something, it, it goes through the filter of information we already have. 
And, and this is why I believe as, as parents that are following after Jesus and stri- striving to raise kingdom kids, that, that we actually start to train our children and give them the truth of God's word early. Because in everything else that they are learned, what? They start to filter it through the information they already have. I, just think about it for a moment that, that there, there are some, I'm hesitant, we got youth class in here. I don't know how young this moves and changes, but, but I mean, even, even some things around some holiday seasons, right? And, and some beliefs that, that as kids, we love to encourage and, and, and all these beliefs. And so they're like, yeah, I believe. And all of a sudden later on in life, they find out something they believed isn't true. But most kids, think about it for a moment. Most kids, when they first find out something isn't true, they always believed. They have all the rationale to know it's, it isn't true. Everything inside of every, all the knowledge they have, they, they know, yeah, that, that can't even happen. But yet when they first hear it, they don't want to believe it. Because the first information they ever had was this is truth, this is truth, and this is what the season's all about, and this and that. And they filter it through the first information. It's important, church, in raising kingdom kids, that yes, we discipline, it's important that we train. If you'd stand with me today, the last area would be coaching. The new year, we're going to have a, a night of just bringing parents together, and we're going to go deeper into some of this stuff. But once we've trained our children, and again, it would tell us this whole parenting idea that it's as they start to hit the teen years that we now turn into coaches. A good coach doesn't just tell you what you're doing wrong. A good coach will show you how to do it right. A good coach actually allows you to be in situations that you may mess up. A good coach knows that you will make mistakes. A good coach is always going to be encouraging. A good coach is always going to be comforting. There's a story in Scripture, and it's one of the most beautiful stories that we see the the Godhead and see the life of Jesus, his earthly ministry about to begin. It's the baptism of Jesus. Side note, we're having a baptism first weekend in December, and if you've not been baptized since you've given your life to Jesus Christ, we'd love for you to be a part of that service. But Jesus, as he is baptized Something amazing happens and transpires, recorded in Matthew chapter 3. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. I heard a guy years ago Actually, I believe it was a lady speaking on on this subject. And this is Jesus, God in flesh, God's son, but yet God would look down from heaven, God the Father, and say, this is my son who I love, whom I'm well pleased and This speaker said something, it was years ago, but they they read this verse and they said, you know what, that there's a longing in the heart of every child. And the reality is, no matter your age, it doesn't really go away. But there is something in the heart of children that, that all they really want is for dad or mom to really look at them and say, I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm pleased with you. And there comes a point in time, mom and dads, where we've done everything we can. And all our kids really need to know that we're just there for them. No matter what.
as we've been walking through this series. The rest of the band, come on back. I, I really felt in prayer this week that there's someone going to be here, someone joining online. I, I don't know, but you've set through this series and in your heart, you're just thinking, man, I, I actually wish I had some of that in my life. I, I wish I had some people that really cared or some people that really tried to raise me upright. Some of you today even, and this is what I really felt in particular, you, you've looked at this and in your heart, you've actually said this, that I, I never had that kind of parent parents never had that adult in my life what I need you to know today is this no matter your story you have a heavenly father who loves you and if you get nothing else out of what we've talked about the last four weeks but you know this that there is a heavenly father who loves you he loves you so much what the bible would teach us is that we were separated from god because of sin because of our choices and stuff that we had done us going our own way and trying to figure it out on our own and the bible says that sin separates us from god that the results the consequences of sin is death But our loving Father said, I'm not going to leave the men and women, the children that I created in my image. I'm not going to leave them separated from me. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And he lived his life, a perfect life as only God in flesh could. Three years of ministry and then he would die on a cross. Paying the price for our sin, dying in our place. You think of God the Father giving His own Son, letting Him die on our behalf. That is how much He loves you. He rose again, proving that He was truly the Son of God. Heads bowed and eyes closed today. I want to ask this first of all, if you're in this room and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're joining us online today, I, I need you to know that God loves you. He loves you. And He offers us forgiveness of sin. He, he offers us eternal life. All we have to do is, is accept it. All we have to do is say, God, I, I, I've been going my own way. I want to turn and follow you. If that's you today, you say, yeah, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Just raise your hand up right now. In this room, you just say, yeah, I want to give my life to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus. Church, right now, we're going to pray together. Those that just raise your hand, you just pray this prayer with me. The rest of the church will join in to make it easy for you. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your love. God, I thank you that you are my heavenly Father. That you sent your Son to be my Savior. Jesus, today, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, church, how do we feel about those who just prayed that prayer? The greatest decision you will ever, ever make. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you. And hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk. And again, you can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.